welcome to the Fire and Earth podcast with your hosts, Jason Mefford and Kathy Groover. Fire and Earth, giving you the keys to unlock your limitless potential. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Fire and Earth podcast. I am your co-host, Kathy Groover. And I'm Jason Mefford. And today we have my good friend, I'm going to try to say this right, Denise Soler Cox. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. I did it. I did it right that time. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I, I am so stoked to have Denise on because she is probably one of the most authentic people that I know. Aww. And um, I say that honestly. And and I think people listening today are going to see that come through. Um, but just a little a little background. She is an award winning winning filmmaker. She has already done an amazing, I mean, this is an amazing film. Um, and we'll make sure and, and link that up in the show notes for people to be able to go out and see that. But Denise, maybe just, just take a minute and, and tell people kind of what you do. Um, Cause you are amazing. I mean, your client list is like the <laughs> fortune 500, right? I mean, if you started <laughs> and everybody would be like, holy shit, you know, she, she's worked with these companies. Yeah, she does. I mean, she, you, mm -hmm. you're legit girl. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thanks so much so yeah I just I got started seven years ago with an idea that I had uh, for a very long time it was uh, an idea that came to me when I was 26 and it was uh, it kind of landed on my heart as something that I needed to do but I could not sum up the courage um, to actually do it and I really fought with my demons for 17 years um, and until one day I just said, you know what, I, I have to do it and I'm going to disregard um, any of these crazy feelings that keep coming up that were basically just like what I call enoughness feelings. Like you're not good enough. You're not even a filmmaker. You have no training. You're not skinny enough. I mean, any enough I was like putting on myself and delaying this project, which was a film. And uh, until one day I just said, screw it. I'm going to be enough to make one phone call. And then I was enough to do the next thing and enough to do the next thing until two years later, I had a documentary film uh, that I made with my partner, who's an Oscar nominated uh, documentarian based in Denver. And um, we've been on the road with that film now for three and a half years. And yeah, it's kind of weird like to even, I mean, yeah, the client list is Fortune 500 companies. The client list is really beyond, um, you know, I had, I had this in my, I had this vision and I knew that it would be, um, I had a sense that it would be big, but it was hard to quantify like how it would end up looking. And so when I see the list of the companies that I've worked with, I'm impressed too. <laughs> Good slightly for you. In disbelief, slightly in disbelief. And they keep calling. So uh, that's, you know, so basically I've been on tour with that film now for three and a half years and we've been in production now with another film. So yeah, life is, life is good. And it's, um, it's crazy when, you know, I really decided to go full throttle with this big idea and kind of what could happen after you, a person does that, you know, it's pretty crazy. That's awesome. Yeah. So tell us a little, what is the, what is your first film about for people that don't know? Yeah. So it's called being Enya and Enya is it's E N Y E and it's the phonetic spelling of the extra letter in the Spanish alphabet, which mm. is the Enya, which that you see in piña, pineapple, senora. The Enya so with the, the with above the, it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and so, uh, and so that the film is called Being Enya. And it's really, it's my life story. And it's about what it was like for me to grow up in the suburbs of Manhattan, not really feeling Latina enough or American enough, uh, really feeling confused about my identity, not knowing where I fit in and really believing that I was the only person that felt like that. I really had the sense that I, it was just me and that I couldn't even put into words the loneliness that I experienced. Mm -hmm. And it's important to note that there was no YouTube. There was no BuzzFeed Latino. There was nobody making content uh, that made me feel connected except for some of the really iconic Latina authors of which there are only about five and I'd read all their books, but it still didn't offer me a sense of connection that I was kind of aching for. And, um, and so the film talks about that and, um, and then we get to meet a bunch of people that I met kind of along the way in my journey. Some of them are famous. And, um, and really the outcome is a bunch of people uh, that are part of this demo, which is we're the children of immigrants from Spanish speaking countries. We were born in the United States. And so we're American, but our parents are from a Spanish speaking country. So we very much also feel that we're from there as well. And so, um, 
the outcome is a bunch of people got to feel like they weren't alone, which was really what my intention was. And it's been a great honor to be able to give people that gift of letting them know, like, you know what, I thought I was alone and you're not, and we're not. And now this is what we're called. And this is our experience. And so I had a chance to validate what I say is a very American experience. Mm-hmm. Well, and I, I agree with that. It's also a very human experience. I mean, because there are times mm-hmm. when I was growing up, and I mean, I go back generations, there were times that I felt weird and that I didn't fit in, that I was alone because I was bullied and picked on for pick any number of things. Your nose is too big, your butt's too small, your hair is too bad. You're, you know, it's like we've all had that experience, and you were able to put that through your cultural eyes, which I think is amazing. Uh, Thank but you. I think every human can relate to that. We've all felt like an outcast at some point, like we're not enough that we don't fit in. Uh, I, I mean, I think we've all felt that way, you know, um, so yeah. good for you. That's, that's an awesome message to be sending, especially, did you do this specifically for youth so that they don't feel alone or is this for adults? I mean, did you have that in mind when you did the film? I really just, it's funny. A lot of people ask me that and I, I really just did it cause I like my, my partner calls it a compulsion. Mm. I did it cause I felt like I, I couldn't live another day without doing it. And so it was, yeah. it was mostly like an expression and it's to like, to anyone that that ever felt like this, this is, this is dedicated to you, you know? And so it totally delights me that more, more people outside the community will say outside the Latino community resonate with it because it's true. It is a human story. It's outside looking in. It's like by design, we just believe we're alone and we're not, it's a lie, but we can't, it's like, we constantly have to be reminded of it, you know? Well, that's why, because when when we first met and we were talking about kind of what you did, right? And again, you know, the, the whole Enya idea of <clears throat> my parents are immigrants. So again, I'm kind of like split between these two worlds, right? And any immigrant family, you know, feels that way or has that. But as we talked about, you know, some of those feelings and, and the things of, you know, not enough and, and kind of like almost this whole familial kind of tie, right? Like, mm-hmm. like our family has so much um, power over us and over our beliefs and it was like as as we were talking about and you were sharing some of the things that these people were experiencing and then i watched the film and i'm like holy shit you know i mean here here i am right i mean white male northern european descent my family came over in the 1700s i mean i don't you don't get more american than than that right Mm -hmm. but i could totally relate to Mm. and see even in my family some of those same things right? Mm -hmm. I mean, because what are some of the things, you know, again, you talked about, you know, not feeling enough. What are a lot of the things that these people are feeling? And then, and then what can we kind of do to help stop that, right? Get us, get us, slap us around and get us out of that. (laughs) So that's interesting that you should ask. So this is something that's fascinating to me. Um, I will say from like a sociological perspective, and that is, um, first that Latino culture is, um, it's, it's, uh, collective culture and so meaning we're about the family we prioritize family over self and it's in, you know it's informed by Catholicism right and it's in, it's, it's informed by things that are, um, you know where you respect the hierarchy so like respecting elders right and so like this there's this whole culture of we don't think about the individual we think about the group and then there's self-reliant culture which is the dominant culture here in the United States uh, informed by Calvinism northern European uh, ideology right and, and religion And that's like independence, uh, singularity, and self. And so neither one are wrong. But here's where it gets interesting is that Latinos here in the United States, especially Enya's, especially those of us that have that connection to that immigrant parent, we feel very, part of the reason why we feel so stuck and in between and like we don't belong is because we grow up in self-reliance where the focus is on self or me, Mm -hmm. but then our families and our parents reinforce it's not about you. It's selfish to be about you. And if they're going to be about you, then you're not about us. And what happens is they end up feeling like when they make decisions, and this is what my coaching group is about, when they make decisions about themselves. So like, let's say they go to college and say, I'm going to be a lawyer, or I'm going to go do something, start a business. And it it takes them out of the home. The most interesting thing happens. And the, the most popular word that I hear from my community after they see my film and when they're in touch with what they really want to do with their life is they say, I feel like I want to do fill in the blank, but I feel like I'm betraying my family if I do that. It is the most bizarre thing. It doesn't make sense. And it's, and especially in a context of self-reliant context, because if you tell someone here in the United States, well, how, how could they say that? It just, it doesn't add up. 
but tell someone from a Latino lens or the collective lens and they can completely get it. And so really my work is to help people make that distinction and to tease those two things apart for people and mm -hmm. help them make a decision for themselves. Like how collective do you want to be and how self-reliant? And because it has to be a decision, you know, it's really like creating an identity, you know, uh, because it feels often like um, for many of us that we have to abide by two sets of rules that are absolutely conflicting. Mm -hmm. And so when we say yes to this, we say no to our, when I, you know, when I say yes to me and my family or my aspirations, it feels like I'm saying no to my family and vice versa. Yep. And so that's a difficult compromise. And that's why people uh, often, and especially Latinas, um, that's why there's so few of us that are out there leading companies, starting businesses. That, that's why, even though it is on the rise, Latina business owners are like the fastest growing group, but it's because I believe that we're beginning to transcend this, but I still believe that there is a lack of understanding of the mechanics as to what's going on in the background. And right. so I, I kind of see myself as someone trying to um, educate people and kind of distinguish this thing and then provide them the support so they can go for the thing they want to do. Yeah, that's so fascinating because there is that conflict there and there's been so many fiction movies about that, about, you know, you want to keep the traditions of your culture, but you want to Americanize yourself and trying to find that balance point has got to be difficult. And I've seen that a lot in the Asian cultures. It's like family yes. is so important and you want to keep the language and you want to keep the tradition, but you also want to go to American university and you want, you know, so what, what's the balance point? I mean, how do you juggle those two worlds? Yeah, so it's funny that you bring up the Asian thing. I forget what that movie was called, but that what crazy rich Asians. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All my mm -hmm. Latino friends were sending me that movie. They were like, Diddy, do you have to see this movie? It's exactly what you talk about all the time. And I watched it and it's like you could just dissect it. And mm -hmm. honestly, like we're we're at the phase right now where it's like the more media can be made about this, uh, the better. Because uh, you know, we just expose it versus like, you know, because it's you know, we could in, they're talking about this in sociology class, but it's like impossible to grasp on a, on a real life level, let's say, but when we see it happening on the screen, whether it's a narrative like that film and a comedy even, right. But we yeah. also saw it on um, my big fat Greek wedding. It was very much mm -hmm. in that sure. film as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and then my film and then, the, you know, my next film, but like the, uh, the more we see it in the media, the more we honestly just get a chance to talk about it and realize first, we're not alone uh, with the struggle. And then second, um, like the emergence of my work, which is, reinvention and deciding, you know, really, really creating uh, the identity that works for your um, best life, mm -hmm. you know, but that conversation can't happen without, it's almost like it can't even happen without a crazy rich change. It can't, it can't happen without seeing it for what it is and how funny it is because it's so often painful and upsetting, you know, so. And you, and you don't really realize it, like you said, until you see it. Because again, you know, now that I know you, I'm, I'm looking more for this kind of stuff, right? And <clears throat> even as you're talking here, you know, about kind of the community and the collective versus the individualistic, right? I mean, so again, I come from that Northern European background, so I've always been taught to be independent. You know, pull up your big boy pants and get stuff done. But yeah. yet my, my family also was like family first, no right. kidding. So, yeah. So I was still getting, you know, some of, some of both of this, you know, and so it's interesting that that's still kind of carried forward, you know, and I'm guessing again that, you know, part of it probably is because of, <clears throat> I mean, my family was farmers up yeah. until, you know, like the last generation. And so as they moved across the country as farmers, you know, in that farming community you had you had kids to run the farm right and mm -hmm. so it was like I mean that that whole collective you got to take care of the family because if the family doesn't pitch in and do what they need to do then we're all gonna die right, right. so right. so some of the, some of that collectivism probably carried further through the generations in my family um, mm -hmm. so you know again even though I know that i I'm trying to be independent. I was taught to be independent. There is that collectivism side of it that I think, again, sometimes now that I'm more conscious about it, it shows up in some of my limiting beliefs. Uh, interesting. That is oh interesting. Gosh, that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. And so I, I, I think, like you said, obviously newer immigrant families, you know, or, or, or groups that have a very strong cultural 
kind of tie, like we talked about, you know, the mm -hmm. Greeks and my big fat Greek wedding, you know, crazy rich Asians, you know, the Latino population. It's, it's all, there's a very strong cultural component to that as well. Um, but we all have some of that carry through. And that's why I love what you said. I mean, what you're doing is more humanitarian and it's trying to help mm -hmm. us start to have these discussions and realize, you know, it's okay to be selfish because in some ways, the more selfish we are, the more we can give to other people too. And again, yes. that's like this whole ironic oxymoron that people have going on. What do you mean if I, you know, do this, then I'm actually helping somebody else? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it's funny. It's like that doesn't seem to add up in Latino culture. I'll say for the most part, I don't want to make a sweeping generalization, but I did a video. I think I told you about this video and it was, you know, why it's a mistake to put your family first. And I was trying to be polarizing. Right. Right. And um, with the, but then I kind of explained it, put your mask on first. And then I did this whole thing. And anyone that watched it, that would say is a millennial or younger, they were getting back to me and they were like, oh my God, I so needed to see this. I so needed to get permission. Thank you for giving me permission or thanks for helping me with this. Cause I feel so guilty, blah, blah, blah. And, um, oh, hang on. Am I okay? There we go. Um, but then uh, the older people, I got comments like crazy. And one of them was the most hurtful thing that's ever been told to me. Um, and basically someone said, you know, you're a disgrace to the Latino community for making this video. Oh. And that one really hurt. But then there was another one that said, you know, what you're saying in this video is going to erode everything that is Latino about being Latino. And so like, that's why I shouldn't do it. And it was fascinating mm -hmm. <clears throat> because there are markers, there are markers that say like, the, this makes you American, this makes you sure. or Latino, let's just say this makes you self-reliant, this makes you, but really we are a mix and we're, um, it, but oftentimes we are, we have a dominant kind of way that we see the world, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but it is interesting to me, the way that people evaluate other people. And this also goes across, you know, culture, ethnicity, this is a definite human thing, like other people kind of saying you are this because of this, and these are the markers to this. And that's what makes you that. And right. um, to me, that's fascinating and, and detrimental and also really uh, detrimental to use if you don't really know what you're, if you don't have an awareness of what, what you're doing. Do you know what I'm saying? If it's right. not in the positive. Does that well, make sense? It, yeah, absolutely. Well, and I'm thinking as you were saying that, what po two things popped into my head, one of which is the African-American community and women who were forced, like they had to straighten their hair and now they're going back to the natural hair because they're embracing mm -hmm. that cultural aspect. And there were so many people who were like, you're not really a black woman because you're straightening your hair and you're trying to be white, you're trying to be American, you're you know, that whole cultural thing. But as you were talking about the, um, the, the, the influence of, of where is that balance point, what struck me as I'm an only child and I'm wondering how much of this is nurture, we can argue nurture versus nature forever, but it's like, I went to college, I left home, I drove cross country immediately. And there were so many people in my community back in Pittsburgh who never, I mean, they left home, but they never left Pittsburgh. They stayed there. Mm. They went to school there. They still live in, mm -hmm. near their families. They say, and I was like, I'm out. And I wonder mm -hmm. if there's a, because I'm an only child and was raised to be, go be independent. Mm -hmm. I just had a different mindset or I shot out of the womb, certainly independent. Uh -huh. uh, do you actually <laughs> see, uh, does it matter if you've come from a big family or if you're an only child? Do, do you see a, a connection between the whole nurture versus nature thing? That I, that's actually a really good question. I don't, I, I see it more. I see the, um, the, it more in um, not as much like nature nurture, but more in the, coming from the homeland country versus being born here conversation. So there's us Latinos and we say we're from, you know, Puerto Rico, like I'm Puerto Rican and Cuban. That's my, that's where my parents are from. Right. And so, um, and people from the homeland countries um, seem to have, you know, they have a different experience. They didn't have to grapple with the um, either world, like either ideology, they're in one and they, and they survive and thrive in a single ideology, you know? Mm -hmm. And so they look at us as uh, we're not, we're more American. And then we struggle because we don't feel American enough. And then, and then we're rejected by the people from the homeland. Cause then we don't seem to be enough for them either. And I right. talk about them, like they're a group, but there is a collective kind of thinking on this, which is fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the, uh, what it kind of, I would say if there's any like, um, dichotomy it's more um it's it lives there and what's mm -hmm. interesting is i screened my film um several years ago 
for most, uh, for many, um, it was a private home, but most people that were there were from the Harvard School of Education. Mm-hmm. And at the, in the Q&A, it was like this really strong listening. Like they were so curious to understand uh, the film and the ideas behind the film. And uh, apparently two women were there. One was from South, uh, South American country and another one was a US born Latina like me. And um, the South American one went, approached the other one, the US based one and, and apologized. And she said, I feel like I haven't really, um, I've been treating you in a certain way that's been unfair. And, oh. uh, and I just want to take responsibility for it. And to me, that was such a big thing, wow. you know, to, you know, to have a moment of, um, of awareness for her, you know, that she was able to see that she was not being very tolerant. And the funny thing is, is I don't, I don't really address that in the film, but it's very much there. If you're, it's there, if you can see it, I guess, yeah. Yeah. you know? Hmm. Well, and I, th- I think, you know, as, as we're talking about this, you know, and trying to, again, you know, I don't fit in here, but I don't fit in over there, you know, kind of thing. I, I think, I think, you know, again, this comes back to kind of a, probably a general human thing where is the world tells us that we're supposed to be a certain way, mm-hmm. right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you, where you kind of come from. And in one of the big movements that we're seeing more and more of, and probably one of the reasons why your work resonates with so many people is a lot of us are kind of stuck in the middle and we're like, well, now hold it just a minute, right? I don't necessarily want to buy into whatever I'm told I'm supposed to do. I'm, I'm a little different than everybody else. And I just really want to be me. And, and, and so again, right, it's like, but, but a lot of us, you know, even like you said, when we started talking, you said, I didn't have the courage to do it, right? Mm-hmm. Because again, you, you kind of felt like, well, I have these feelings, I want to do this, but I'm not really supposed to, because that kind of goes against the rules, right, of whatever it happens to be. And I think we all, in, in different aspects of our life, we all have that, right? Mm. Yeah, and, and so, and so having the courage to actually be authentic and say, no, I want to do this, right? Mm-hmm. Hey, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a 20 something Latina woman and I want to be the CEO of a fortune 500 company. Hey, mm-hmm. if you want to do that, great, go do it, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? That we should have the courage to actually do it. Or if somebody says, Hey, you know what? I just want to be a mom. That's what mm-hmm. I want to do. I don't want to mm-hmm. go the corporate route. And, but if that's really what the person wants to do, then go do it. Right. right. Um, in, instead of kind of being stuck in, in doing what you think everybody else expects you to do. Right. Right. So it's I mean, very hard though. It's very hard. It's, very hard. Hard. it's like, it's like that belief system. Cause we know there's something else possible. I feel like is that, you know, but it's so hard to see ourselves that way. And it's because of what we feel like, you know, we, you know, I heard one, someone say like, you really don't know your negative belief systems or your limiting belief systems, because if you did, then, then they wouldn't limit you. Like, right. if you really, <laughs> then you would just know what they were, you know? And yeah. so I feel like a lot of it is, uh, for us not knowing that it's like, hang on, that's just how I see the world. And, right. um, which is why I start, you know, the film really unlocks like a new, it, I, I say that it's, it helps build like a fish when it jumps out of water. Like my, one of my favorite things of all time is the three mysteries of life are uh, water to the bird. Um, no, yeah, water to the fish, air to the bird and man to himself. Yeah. And, uh, and so I say like that my work is um, like, t- you know, giving people an opportunity to be the fish out of water, even just for a few minutes or a few seconds. Mm-hmm. And then we have the awareness, make a decision to do something different and then hopefully act by the time we're back in the water. But right. it's really like, it's really complicated because it feels so true. Like if I do something for me, then I feel betra- I will, I'm betraying my family. That's a strong feeling, you know, mm-hmm. and to, and to go against that. And, you know, it's really hard. And to know, like I was, when I was in that meeting yesterday, pitching my new film, I, I said, the joke's on us. Cause really the barrier is that we feel it like is, is like steel. It feels so real, but really it's like a tissue. It's that thin. Mm -hmm. but we don't have that awareness. And I, I agree, like human beings live by a set of rules. Like I can't do this. They can, and I can't for so many things. I can't Mm -hmm. have this, even though they can, you know? And so it's really, uh, you know, taking it and on, on top of the humanity part, taking and overlaying a cultural 
set of roles. So there's like a human set of roles and then a cultural set of roles. It's mm -hmm. fascinating. And then I'm sure it's the same way in an individual family too, because my dad wanted a boy and my mom wanted a good Catholic girl. Uh -huh. So there was, she, <laughs> want, she wanted me to be a housewife, marry the boy next door. And my dad was like, go play, run around, kick any boy's butt. Let me throw, show you how to throw a football. So even in my family, just with the three of us, there was that conflict. So I can't imagine mm. culturally how, with the family versus the entire culture. But let, let me ask you this, because I'm listening to you talk, and I used to be an actor. I know what filmmaking does. I do. How were you different after you made that film? Oh my gosh, thanks for asking that question. Uh, I, it's funny, I, I was transformed. I feel like the biggest benefactor. And in a way, it's almost like my selfishness, like it was, it was like the biggest selfish act, the most generous act of selfishness. <laughs> <laughs> love, I love that generous act of selfishness. Writing that down. We're all writing it down. Everyone at home. That's generous act That's of selfishness. That's a great name. <laughs> because yeah, I really. was really, I really won biggest. I feel like, and because I got to see all, I got to see it from the other side. I got to work through so much stuff. Like yeah. there was no way I could come out at the other end and still be the same person. Especially since it was about my life story and things mm -hmm. I chose to share, things I didn't. Things I things I decided you know um, decided to keep in things I it, it, it was it was an unprecedented amount of personal transformation that I put myself through, and um, I kind of kicked and screamed throughout it, and um, and the funny thing is the thing I was the most afraid of um, was that people would know me, and uh, which is funny and ironic since I knew all along that we were making a film about my life, so of course, but like. Um, I was so afraid to be known um, that I was terrified the first time we screened the film and it was here mm -hmm. in New York City when we screened it. And, uh, and I remember feeling like this was the biggest mistake I have made in my entire life. Like now everyone's going to know about my life and now like it's like it's over, you know, like to really mm -hmm. be known. Cause I feel like that's what people want in many ways, but it's really hard to be the idea to be, uh, that feeling of being exposed and people knowing about the, you know, and really just facts. It's not like, um, it's just, it's, it's bizarre and warped how preoccupied I was with that mm -hmm. and how three years later and 109, I just did my 109th uh, event that's uh, related to the film. Good. And um, I, uh, and it's been the biggest gift of my life to be known. It's incredible yeah. to be known and to have people know and like me anyway, and maybe even like me more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think the more we actually know a person, the more uh -huh. we actually like them. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so, but, but again, it's, it's scary to do that. Cause like, oh, I, yeah. I mean, I can, I can only imagine, you know, you sitting there and having kind of this, oh, you know, everybody's going to be watching this now. And you're kind of looking around like, cause I know it's a, there's a lot of actors, they never watch their movies. Yeah. Uh-huh. Right. Because yeah. because I think it's a it's that same thing. It's like, nope, I don't I don't want to see. I'm just gonna trust that the director did whatever, you know, I did my job, boom, moving on. Mm -hmm. Kind of right. thing where you're actually like watching it all the time and seeing people's actual reaction to it. And there's a vulnerability to that and there's an exposure oh, yeah. to that. It's walking down the streets naked to show all of this life. And I had a client yesterday, I was doing some coaching work, work with, she has a story that she's trying to work on. It's not even a personal story. And she doesn't uh -huh. want to bring it into the light. For some reason, she oh can't gosh. get this story out onto paper. Um, I don't know why, I mean, she just has, she's not writer's block. She told me the entire story, but she can't put it on paper. She said, because then it becomes real. And I'm Whoa. sure that's, you know, and it's, I'm sure that's the same thing for you is, if I show this to everybody, I'm exposing my inner little kid, which is a very scary thing. I mean, you, you're, it just, you're bearing your soul, which, which is amazing. And once again, we've blown through a very quick half an hour. So <laughs> uh, we do this, we're like, blah, blah, blah. And then we just, we realize we're done. Um, we have a couple minutes left. Uh, Jason, anything you want to, I'll let you wrap and then we'll go back. to. Well, yeah, because what I wanted to do is, you know, we've had a great discussion, but I wanted to kind of leave the listeners with some takeaways too. So maybe Denise, if you can just kind of share, I mean, you kind of shared your story and I mean, we can see and feel the emotion that you had kind of doing this project, the impact it's having on people, but, but maybe, maybe give some tips on what did you learn through the process, right? Like, like what are some things that people need to do 
uh, and, and how you kind of help people do that, right? Because again, it's like, okay, we all realize this now, but now what are we going to do about it, right? Because, because realization is like, it is the first step, but now what do we have to do to kind of work through that um, and, and kind of move forward? And so you've actually personally had to do this yourself, right? So yeah. what are the steps you kind of did, what you learned, and then how you try to help people or the steps that you give people to kind of help them get through that process too? Yeah. Uh, so I would say first, a lot of people, when they hear me, they'll say, um, you know, I, well, some people will say this, like, I don't know what I'm passionate about, or I don't know what the thing is I would do. I, you know, we're different. You and me are different. And I would say to anyone that feels like that, um, look and see if you really want to know what your passion is and like what you're here to do, look and see what you always talk about, because this is all I ever talked about. Uh. I just was very limited in my ability to talk about it because I didn't have any on the ground experience beyond, um, you know, my life experience, but I didn't have all the interviews. I interviewed over a hundred people. I had so hours and hours and hours of additional conversation about it. Um, I, and I, you know, now I just have so much clarity about this thing that I was so fascinated with. Um, and so it's like that magnificent obsession. I forget like, who said that, or maybe Wallace Waddles. I don't know. Someone said uh, the thinking grow rich guy. I'm not sure, but like someone talked about a magnificent obsession and like we're all obsessed with something I don't care if it's video games or I don't know what but like look and see what you're obsessed with and what you're you would talk about and what you would talk about for free and that's really where the passion lies and where the potential future for you lies mm -hmm. and the second biggest thing is listen you know it's so cliche but like my head effed me up like my head was telling me like you're not this you're not that and it, my head would say uh, you're not skinny enough you know anything that I was like preoccupied with about my own enoughness and my own ability to accomplish anything in life. It's like my mind showed me all the ways I couldn't do it. And it just brought up the past, you know, and, but my heart was saying, no, like there's, I just always saw opportunities. I would watch my big fat Greek wedding, or I would see an example of something in the world where I felt like this conversation this is where this conversation could be inserted. This is where this conversation would, could add to the, you know, could add and enhance people's experience. But I was terrified to deal with my demons and the demons, you know, the, that was the gift. The gift was if mm. you do it, you deal with the demons, but that's the gift. And like I said, it's, it really does feel selfish and it does feel like I'm the biggest benefactor because I'm the one that won the, the bit, the biggest. And it's because I got to half, to look at what about me feels like I don't I'm not good enough for this and I had to like tear down those belief systems otherwise I wouldn't have been able to finish and I certainly wouldn't have been able to have the resilience to continue to go and travel all over the country continue to share confidently right the mm -hmm. message and um and really you know just can it's like layer by layer by layer but that's the opportunity and I know it's terrifying and it's so worthwhile. And so really what I do is I only listen here. And this is always there. It's like my freaking, it's like the devil and the angel. Sometimes I feel like this is the devil and this is the angel. And Latinos always say, and then there's your mother, the devil, the angel, <laughs> and the mother, the separate, a separate thing all together. But anyway, so yeah, that's what those two big things is what I would say made the biggest difference for me. Mm -hmm. And I have one last question. What do your parents think yeah. of us? Well, um, at first, um, you know, my mom, I would say, was very concerned about uh, the making of the film. And that was just a, real, it was a very hard chapter of our relationship. Mm -hmm. um, but then she came around and uh, we were joking about it yesterday um, at my meeting and saying that at first she was opposed to it. But then when it came out, she was very excited. And, um, and then any screening that happens in the New York area, even up to Boston, she shows up for and she typically she'll take the mic first I'm like okay so are there any questions uh, my mom's hand goes up first and then she like owns that mic for however long she wants it and so I always kind of have to let her do her thing <laughs> that's great but, uh, yeah so she's a big fan now but at first no it was hard it was almost too hard it was it was almost too it almost stopped me from doing it I had to make a decision mm. uh, and almost risk the relationship um, uh, but I decided, uh, I decided to keep going and believing that I could do it in a way that would honor everyone yeah. whose story is also a part of my story, you know? Yeah. 
That's so great. That's so great. So why don't you tell everybody how they can reach you, the website, the all that good info, and then we'll uh, we'll move on. <laughs> yeah. So uh, for anyone that wants to see the film, you can watch it right on your computer at anyathemovie.com. So it's E N Y E themovie.com, and you can watch it right there on your computer. And then uh, if you want to hear about the next thing. So there's going to be people that listen that, that are going to be thinking about the ideas that I just shared. They're going to see the movie. They're going to even, the stuff's going to swirl around even more. And I have a program for that. And it's really awesome. around unlocking your own dreams and supporting people to get to the point B person, which is, I talk about a lot. Point A was afraid. And that point A is, we're always at point A today. And the aspirational version of ourselves is point B. The person that I see myself that that I could be the person that can make another film and have that win awards too. And the person that could do the next thing uh, in the great way that I kind of, I ideate that it could happen, you know, that version of me. So I help people uh, get to um, kind of presence point B um, for as long as, as they'll allow me to in my program. <laughs> and uh, many women that have joined the program, it's called the Enya Dream Accelerator, um, have created their dream job, their dream life, and um, taking trips around the world, oh. speaking. Someone just, you know, started a new online program, writing books, uh, getting trademarks and copyrights. I mean, crazy things that people have just put on the shelf and put on hold. They get in my program and they're like, you know what? No, now is the time. I'm, I'm doing it now. And so that's the kind of the promise of the program. So great. Uh, and I'm glad. <clears throat> I'm Ugh, sorry, I got a little something in my throat there. Ah! <laughs> I'm, I'm you were doing so and well, and then there goes Jason. Okay, all right. But I'm, I'm glad that you're doing that because because I, I hope one of the things that the listeners heard as we were going through this is when you come to the realization and you've got to start making a change, it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard, and you need help to be able to do it, right? And so so having an opportunity for that. And again, I mean... Your, your movie is literally going to impact millions of people, right? Oh, thanks, Jason. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It really is. Totally, totally. I mean, and, and again, I mean, you're working on a new film. You, it, everybody's going to know who you are, right? Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and it's, but, it, but again, it's even your journey, it's hard. You need help mm -hmm. along the way. You need to have that courage. You need other people around you. Right, because I know you didn't talk talk about the particular story, but I know like they talk about in the movie, right? When you when you're in in uh, Miami, mm -hmm. and you finally have that realization, like, hold it, I am not the only one who feels this way because you know these ten people that are in this in this club with me, they're all saying the same thing, mm -hmm. right? And so when you can become a part of a group like that, then you realize you're not alone, and other mm -hmm. people have done this, and other people can do this, and they will give you encouragement. They will support you along the way. And so, you know, like I said, not only the movie, but what you're doing with these women in the, in the NA, ED, I, I know it's EDA, NA uh -huh. Dream Accelerator. Yes. Um, <laughs> is, is actually putting the rubber to the road and literally transforming these women's lives. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're having a big impact. I know you, I know you said you, you got a lot out of this, but I know you're giving a lot back to the world and that's, oh, you need more people you. doing that. So. Thanks, Jason. Yay. Well, this Thank has you. been a phenomenal episode. This has been an, such an awesome cover. We have the best conversations. You're amazing. Thank you so much Thank for what you're you. doing. Thanks for finding her, Jason. Um, <laughs> we have to sign off or will this will be a 30-hour podcast. I know. Um, I'm Kathy Groover, and I can be reached at kathygroover.com. And I'm Jason Mefford. I can be reached at jasonmefford.com. And we'll see you on a future episode of the Fire and Earth podcast. See ya. See ya. Bye. Thank you.